Raka, welcome to the Pursuing Uncomfortable podcast. How are you today? Oh, wonderful. Really happy to be here. Thank you. And where are you joining us from? I'm in Israel right now. Yeah. <laughs> That's exciting from coming from halfway around the world. I love it. It's so amazing that we can do this. I love it. Yeah. Bracca, you've got a lot going on in your life. So tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do. Okay, sure. Um, well, I'm the author of 41 books that I see books that help children's souls to shine. And 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 then I'm the author of a memoir, one handed memoir for adults about my journey. And um Let's see. I, I, I also have, I never mentioned this, but I don't know why I feel like I'm doing it. I, I have six children who are, well, you know, grown their wonderful parents. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. You've got a lot of life experience raising six children, for sure. Yeah. Thank God. Wonderful. And I forgot to mention my wonderful husband, of course. I forgot to mention him. Yeah. <laughs> Well, we can't leave him out. Right. So, Bracca, tell us, the. I love the title of your memoir. Would you share that with us, please? Oh, good. Yeah. Searching for God in the Garbage. Yes, that's the name of my memoir. Love that. Thank you. What brought that on? Do you want to tell us where you were or what brought you to that place? Okay, sure. Well, well... It, it's, 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 I guess not a typical book because how I put it together, I took entries from my diary, which became my journal when I got on there and also letters that I wrote along the way. Plus I filled in the missing pieces. So it's kind of like a documentary almost. You, you watch me slowly developing food addictions. And then healing, and then the healing process. Yeah. And it's nothing's typical about it. I mean, what is typical about it is the pain, a universal kind of pain, the emptiness that I felt and how I tried to fill it. And that involves searching mm -hmm. in the garbage because I was searching everywhere to fill the inner emptiness. I had no idea how to fill it. I didn't know what was missing, but I knew something was missing that, that made life meaningless, unbearable, that made me feel estranged from life, that made the whole world feel gray. That, that's, that's how I felt during those years of in getting increasingly deeper into the food addiction. Um, I, I graduated from Harvard. And then I went on to medical school. I looked like I was a success on the outside, but inside I was in a prison and the cage was getting smaller and smaller. That's what an addiction is like. So that's, that's what I experienced. Mm -hmm. And, and I was also at my lowest point, I was literally looking through the garbage. And when I found that, when I realized the connection at the end of the book, it's, it's kind of like a psychological mystery because I had an epiphany. What, why was I looking through the garbage? I was looking for mm -hmm. what had been thrown away. What still had value. Mm -hmm. That was my roots. That was my heritage that I eventually found. And then, gave my life new meaning and, and nourished my, my, my truly starving soul. Wow, that's quite a journey. And I think you really hit on something when you said 
that by all accounts on the outside, you looked successful. You looked probably enviable to so many people, but yet inside you felt like you were in a prison. And I'm guessing that a lot of people can identify with that description. Yes, that's, that's, um, an addiction. I, I, I saw this definition someplace. And addiction is when you, you give up everything for something. And when you heal from that addiction, you give up one thing and you get everything. It's right. That's what it feels like. You just come out of that very narrow place that really our thoughts create the cage. That's the cage that we get into. And, you know, as we get, and, and the more secretive we are, addictions are very secretive. So nobody knows how you're suffering. The more it does come out into the light, that's part of the healing process. So, so actually that book, the book, the publishing of it, people would say to me, why in the world did you publish this kind of stuff? It's very raw, very candid about the worst times in my life. If people say your life's so great now, why are you, why are you publicizing this horrible stuff? Because when I hear it, it helps other people to open up about their own darkness, you know, and they're less afraid to. And that's why did I go through all that? We, we all go through things not to see, we're here not to see through each other, to see each other through. We're all here to help each other with our challenges that we're given. It, it's not an accident. We're, we're given these things purposely and, and it's all part of the design to help each other heal. Mm. Why do you think people overeat? <laughs> yes. I, why do people overeat? I, why do I overeat or why I think other people overeat is that when we experience that immediate pleasure, Food is pleasurable. It's designed to be pleasurable. When we experience it, we want the pleasure to keep lasting. If, we, if we're not aware of the abundance of other pleasures in our life, then we want that immediate pleasure to keep going. On my 600-pound life, it's a show. The, the people all say the same thing on every show. This is the only pleasure I have in life is eating. That's, that's what happens with an addiction. It becomes, it takes over as the only pleasure left in a person's life. So the way to heal is to pour in more joy, bring on other pleasures. It's, it's not about restrictions because those don't last long. Dieting doesn't last. It's all, I would. I was part of like um, the yo-yo dieting where I would go on these horrible binges and then very restrictive dieting. So from the outside, nobody could tell. Nobody could tell how I was suffering mm. because you couldn't see it. I wasn't emaciated skinny and I wasn't obese. So you couldn't tell that I, how I was suffering because I was doing one or the other. It was a horrible way to live. It wasn't based at all on physical hunger. It was based on an empty hole that I was trying to fill. So we overeat because of that emptiness within. The more desperately we try to fill with externalities that hole, the bigger it gets. So it's such it's a spiritual hole. It's not a physical hole. So all that food isn't going to help. It's it's recognizing that there's an abundance of ways to bring pleasure into our life, not just that one narrow way. Yeah. You talk about the pleasure ladder. What is that? Yeah. Th thank you so much. The pleasure ladder is the description. It gives us a roadmap about all the other pleasures available. I'm going to hold up this chart. I love this. This is very basic. There's five levels, five rungs on the pleasure ladder. And it corresponds 
to the five levels of the human soul. So as we fill ourselves up with these pleasures, it elevates, it nourishes both our body and our soul. And I think also it relates to the five fingers because it's within our power every moment to bring these pleasures into our lives. We have the power not dependent on anybody else. So this is a totally empowering way to live. All the physical pleasures are on the lowest level. When we experience joy from all the natural foods that are designed to give us pleasure, then we, when we experience them with gratitude, it elevates us physically and spiritually because we feel that gratitude. Also spending time in nature, enjoying music, moving, dancing, gardening, all of these things uplift both our body and our soul. And then the next level up is love, which is, you would think love is dependent on somebody else, right? But then this definition of love, mm -hmm. it's a spiritual thing. It's focusing on the virtues of another. When we do that, we could do that again in prison or in the prison of an addiction. It's mm -hmm. just, let's say a person's in prison and they focus on what a grandmother once did for them many years ago. They are filled with this warm emotional feeling of love that can encourage them and uplift them. So that's also, uh, that's the next level. The third level is meaning, doing something meaningful. I was on another show that the guy was describing, the, when I described meaning, he said, yeah, the other day he was sitting by himself and he was just plowing through a box of pizza after eating 10 slices. He's just continuing. Someone knocks on his door and needs his help for a couple of minutes. He comes back afterwards. He doesn't want the pizza anymore. He puts the rest in the fridge. He got filled up. Doing something kind for someone else fills you up with a more lasting pleasure. Each one up is a higher, more lasting pleasure. Even greater than that is creativity. When we put a unique part of ourselves into the world, doing a podcast, writing a book, cooking an amazing dinner, whatever is your thing, telling stories, you know, whatever you is your creative talent, putting it in the world, you go into a zone, you don't feel like eating or sleeping, you are on such a high while you're being creative. The highest is transcendence. That's what you've experienced like under a starry, starry sky at night. Days with you forever. Um, it's that feeling of connection with everybody, with everyone, and recognizing that we're all connected to the same source, the same energy source. We're all, all, all connected. So to climb this ladder, there's just one price to pay. And that is gratitude. That is what, that is what helps us climb every single rung on the pleasure ladder. We can climb them simultaneously. We could do something meaningful with a physical pleasure, you know, but we, but it's all about bringing gratitude into our life. This is how we find lasting pleasure. So just a quick recap, the first rung, number five on the ladder, the first rung to step onto is enjoying those physical things this world offers. The next rung then is love, focusing on those virtuous characteristics of others. From there is meaning when we have something meaningful in our lives. Uh, the fourth rung of five is creativity, whatever our medium might be. And then finally, that transcendence that connects all of us to each other and to the universe beyond. Exactly. And people, if you want to get a copy of that, there's a link in the show notes and you can download that to have for yourself and some other nice teachings and whatnot that go along with that. So make sure you click that link. Now, if we can switch uh, 
switch gears for a moment, Bracca. Let's hear about your children's books that you've written. Thank you so much. The books also, they're designed to teach people to infuse joyful skills from the very beginning of life so they don't have to play catch up the rest of their lives like so many of us. That's That's been my whole goal. Mm. And some of my books are about prevention of abuse. Some books are about sensitivity to disabilities. There are books about eating healthy. There's books about loss. If a child loses someone important in their life, these are all things that put um, clouds on the sunshine. You know, I, I have a great way of showing this. We all have this, this, this shining light in our soul. And as difficult things happen to us, like abuse, you know, the, this puts, this puts a cloud over us, but the, it's still shining. It never stops shining. So how can we melt away the clouds by, by nourishing our lives, filling our lives with more and more joy, with more gratitude for all the simple, beautiful joys in life? And sometimes we need therapeutic intervention or a coach, you know, to help us remove these blockages. It's, it's, but this is always here. It's shining as purely and beautifully and uniquely as it ever was, even if we're not feeling it because of, because of difficult traumas a person has been through or a, or a child from, especially from childhood. So all my books mm -hmm. are designed to help children recognize that they're spiritual beings from the very beginning of their life and how to gain happiness skills to to use them throughout life. I think a lot of people get hung up on the spirituality of their being. Some people perhaps have had a bad experience with religion or faith communities and confuse their own spirituality with the reality of a faith community. And I have a few things to say about that. One, um, faith communities are human institutions and they are not perfect. And, you know, that's not to excuse poor behavior, not at all. But there are a lot of faith communities out there and religious groups that do seek to build up and to uh, help to heal from trauma and all of those things. And hopefully you can connect with one of those. But also spirituality, we can nourish our spirits in so many ways. And faith communities, religions are one path to actualize that spiritual awareness within us, but there are others. What would you respond with to that? Yeah. So I, I sometimes I enjoy when people say, yeah, I like spirituality, but not organized religion. And I, 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 what in my head, I feel like saying, you want a disorganized religion? You know what I mean? Like my point is like they started someplace too. These are revolutionaries that started these religions. You know what I mean? And like, there's a reason that some of them, you know, took off amazingly. There's a reason why they've continued. There's, there's valuable wisdom to be gained that we shouldn't just discern. I, I, I feel like, you know, my, my roots and my heritage was just discarded. Very little of it remained for me. What, what was the main for me to see was like cultural aspects, but the spirituality was taught. So I didn't even recognize that there was spirituality in, in my own religion. I had no idea until I searched as a young adult. And when I found the deep truths and the wisdom, whoa, I was blown away. I had no idea it was in my own backyard because I was searching everywhere in other religions too. And I was searching... Mm you know, social action, environmental, certain everything, drugs, relationships, where is the answer? And searching to Harvard too. I was looking for the wisdom to life. I, I didn't find it at Harvard, though I had a great time there in certain ways, you know? But mm -hmm. like, there is this ancient wisdom for a reason and, and revealing it 
digging it out from where it's been buried has been a tremendous joy for me too. So, so the ancient mystical wisdom has lots to teach us. And I do encourage people to explore their roots. I think it's like, because when, you know, one of the things I learned in yoga is root down to rise up. The more secure you feel in your foundation, the more freedom you feel to branch out and be creative. So, yeah. Mm. That's beautiful. So here's an easy question. What's the meaning of life? <laughs> I love it. And that was my question. I was searching from age 12. My book, my memoir goes from age 12 to 32. So at 12, I started asking, you know, all of a sudden this awareness comes, this new consciousness. What is the purpose to life? And, and what I finally got at age 22, when I met this, and really an old rabbi who's no longer alive, but what he said blew me away. He's dressed in black, long beard. The last thing I would expect him to say was that the purpose of life is to experience the greatest pleasure possible. What? But then I began to understand, you know, the pleasure ladder is what he explained to me. The, the, the deepest pleasures in life are the spiritual pleasures. Those are the lasting pleasures. And the physical pleasures become spiritual pleasures when we experience them with gratitude. That's how we mm. transform them. They transcend into mm. spiritual pleasures when we experience the natural physical pleasures with gratitude. So that's, that's when I've learned that we're really here. Our job, we have just one job to do here to experience gratitude. We were placed in this amazing garden with an abundance of goodness, and we've gotten really far away from that. So coming back to the garden and appreciating so many of the gifts and recognizing the abundance changes life completely from gray. That's how the colors return to the world for me. Yeah. What a beautiful sentiment. Bronca, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for all you're doing, Melissa. Thank you.